Hello and welcome to Mind Your Loaf, a podcast about taking action on your mental health. I'm Jason Byrne and along with Irish mental health charity TurnToMe.ie who besides helping us with this podcast provide professional mental health support online free to everyone in Ireland. That can only be a good thing. So everybody here, we have Sarah Knight. Uh, how are you, Sarah? Thank you for joining us. I'm fine, thank you. So, so where, where are you right now, Sarah? Are you at home? Yes, I live in the Dominican Republic. So I am in the Caribbean. It is not very sunny today, so don't be jealous. Well, listen, welcome to Ireland, Sarah. <laughs> and, and I think this is the only way we're going to be traveling right now is you're going to be coming to Ireland this way and I'm going to be going to the Dominican Republic that way, which is near, is that, that's near Haiti and then Cuba and then Florida. Isn't that how that works? Is that where that is? Yes, the Dominican Republic shares the island of Hispaniola with Haiti. So we have a border with Haiti uh, and we are south, uh, I guess, southeast, no, southwest of Puerto Rico and south of Florida. Mm -hmm. So you're in a really shit hot place. Basically. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's terrible. It's just, it's palm trees everywhere, <laughs> white sandy beaches. Um, but, could could not be a worse place to be, to be quarantined. But listen. No, it's lovely. It, well, it, and this is the whole, this is what, because what we'll do, I mean, I've got, I've got questions, you can't even see them, they're taped all over the wall. So I only, I only mm. have half an hour so to talk to you. But let's, first of all, you, you are an author of, now, I have a list of the books here. Like I, I have my own one, which was like basically, which was, which was the one here, which was Calm the Fuck Down. I got this, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is how me and Sarah actually met across, across Twitter, was I, I uh, got my Calm the Fuck Down book and put it into my bag in a kind of uh, temper way because I couldn't get it in. And then I ripped the cover on it. So the, so the irony of it was really weird. It was like, you know, Calm the Fuck Down book was now ripped. And then you seen that and then you sent me a fresh one. So thank you, Sarah. Yes. You're very good. But you have, you have loads of these books. So they're not even trilogies. They're, they're mint. Like how many have you done? You've done loads of these books. There's no need to name them on. There's just so many. Yeah, there are five books and actually three journals. Two journals and one more coming out in, in October. So okay, and it's a, it's a lot. It, it, yeah, and you're well known in Ireland here because that's I'm so excited to have you on. But tell, can you just quickly summarize your story, like when you left your the publishing company, the the book company, like, and to where you got now, just so they'll know. Yes, I'll try to do it quickly. Yeah. Uh, in 2015, I quit my corporate job. I was a book editor uh, at Simon and Schuster. I had been in the business for 15 years, uh, living in New York City. And I had been really anxious and panicky and depressed for the preceding few years. Yeah. And for the year before I quit my job, I got really serious about making some changes in my life. I realized after some soul searching uh, and some making really tough decisions and, and getting prepared to take some risks that it was in fact my job and working for a corporation, uh, not my job like the editing that I was doing, which I loved, but just working in corporate America was not for me. And it was the thing I was going to have to change if I wanted to improve my mental health and, and well-being. So I saved up money for a year and I planned and plotted and I quit that job and I decided to go freelance as a book editor, but just working for myself. Uh, but then I had the idea for my first book, The Life-Changing Magic of Not Giving a Fuck, which was... <laughs> originally intended as a, an affectionate parody of a Japanese tidying guide that I'm sure everybody's heard of. Yeah. Um, and it was all about, you know, how I had stopped caring about things that I didn't, that I didn't like, you know, things that, that were not bringing me joy, so to speak, um, and how much better my life had gotten. So I wrote that book and now here we are five years later, five books, three journals, whole new career that I was not expecting. And I also left New York and moved to a tropical island with my husband. Okay, and so let's get into the fucks big time here now. Because in Ireland, we, we love the cursing, by the way. So there's no problem with oh. this here. Oh, I know. So, <laughs> and, and in Ireland, um, you would hear a lot of people saying, in Ireland, you would hear the phrase quite a lot, I don't give a fuck, right? I don't give a fuck. But the people who give a fuck the most in the world are the Irish, okay? So mm -hmm. they actually hold a lot of what you would call fucks in their heads, including myself. A lot of us have... Like we, we really do care about what people think about us. We would say behind people's backs, oh, I don't give a shit what someone thinks of me. But in Ireland, we have a clutter of fucks in our heads and we, we cram them in every day. And so I, I know in your books a lot, you talk about trying to sort that out, like declutter. Like how, how can people 
like sort out so many folks in our head? Uh, well, I do. I call it mental decluttering. And, you know, it started with the life changing magic of not giving a fuck as this parody of the physical decluttering book by Marie Kondo. And I said, you know, instead of looking at your physical possessions and pulling your socks out of the drawer and asking if they bring you joy and, you know, and giving them away to, to the church or goodwill or whatever, if they don't, um, really look inside your head, uh, inside all of the demands that are being made of you, all of the things that are being asked of you. Um, and all of the ways in which people are asking you to spend your time, energy, and money. And those are your fuck bucks. <laughs> and deciding how to spend them wisely is making a fuck budget and sticking to it. <laughs> so the idea of mental decluttering is to sit down, write down all of those demands that are being made of your time, energy, and money. Mm -hmm. And then instead of looking at what brings you joy, look at what annoys the fuck out of you. Oh, Jesus. And say... I do not care about that. And giving a fuck is um, another way to say caring. I give a fuck. I care about something. I don't give a fuck. I don't care about it. But then the next step is giving your fucks in the form of your time, energy, and money to those things. And so you don't want to do that if, if it's going to deplete all of your resources on things that you don't care about. Um, so the process of mental decluttering is the same as physical decluttering. It is to discard the things that do not serve you. Um, and then organize your life around what's left. So for example, because I know listeners love, love a concrete example. Yes. Um, you know, if you are spending too much time at work and you are not seeing enough of your family and you sit down and say, gee, it really annoys me to be at work an extra hour and a half every single day and to not get that hour and a half with my partner or my children. Um, I need to make a change. I need to stop giving my time and energy fuck bucks to overtime at work that I'm not getting compensated for. Yep. And I need to start, you know, getting home earlier so that I can spend those time and energy fuck bucks with my family. Um, so it's really a process of, you know, being honest with yourself, asking yourself these questions, answering them honestly, and then reallocating your resources. And the, the thing I heard you talk about as well, which sets Irish people's hearts into an absolute race is saying no to people. We don't, <laughs> we, we, we say yeah to everything. I'll, I'll give you a quick, lovely example. In New York, I was there doing shows and afterwards we were at a party and we were standing in a circle and there was a couple of New Yorkers and a couple of Irish people. And one of the New Yorkers went to the toilet and the Irish guy said, I don't really like him. And the New Yorker said, why don't you tell him? And he went, no fucking way, I'm not telling him. <laughs> so... In Ireland, we have a load of friends and we probably only like half of them, but we're too afraid to say no or go away. And when we are invited to things, Sarah, we say yes to everything here. So how do you say no? Well, have I got a book for you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but, so my most recent book is called Fuck No, How to Stop Saying Yes When You Can't, You Shouldn't, or You Just Don't Want To. Oh. And it's very important that people that are listening understand that my books are all about using honesty and politeness to make your decisions and to convey them. We're not here to hurt people's feelings. I'm not trying to raise a generation of, of sociopaths. Um, but you have to be able to say no and, and set and maintain your own boundaries if you are going to have any hope of enjoying this, the short life that you have. Um, so I have like lots and lots of there's like 600 examples in fuck no of exactly how to say it, why you should be saying it, who you should be saying it to. But in the sense of getting an invitation to something and saying yes, even if you don't want to go, you don't like the people, you don't have time. It's going to, you know, say there's a dinner party and it's, uh, you know, it starts at nine o'clock on a Tuesday night. Oh. And it's going to go until midnight and you have to get up early for work. And also you don't really want to be pressured into drinking because you don't want to be hungover for work. And maybe you even want to get up extra early to go to the gym. Bless you. I would not do that, but maybe no. you want to do that. Mm -hmm. And you want to say no to this dinner party, but if you're Irish, you say yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, straight away. So the, the deal is you have to be able to just say, no, thanks. I can't make it. You know, you don't have to give a reason. You don't have to tell your friend, maybe you don't want to go because your friend who's hosting the party has a new boyfriend and you don't like him and you don't want to get seated next to him and you don't want to deal with him for three hours on a Tuesday night. You don't have to say that because that's honest, but it's not polite. So you have to be able to take these pillars of honesty and politeness and find you know, the, the point at which they intersect that is a way for you to express your no without 
hurting somebody else's feelings. It's yeah. really not that hard. Yeah, I know. I but, but when we say no to people uh, and, and they go, oh, oh, you're not coming. Oh, you're not coming. Oh, OK, fine. We now play out in our heads what that party's like. So they're going, oh, my God, Jason didn't come. He's such a shithead. I can't believe it. And like, and we're just, this is what we're doing. We're also predicting that they're talking about us. They, oh, my God, they're never going to invite me ever again. But you're saying you got to be brave just to say no and kind of so not give a shit that way. Yeah, there's two aspects to that. One is you have to stop giving a fuck about what other people think. That's mm. actually the very first process that I take you through in my very first book, um, because you can't control other people's opinions. You can only control your own behavior and know whether you've acted responsibly and respectfully. And if you have, then you have nothing to apologize for. You you are not sorry, which is why I call it the not sorry method. Um, you have done your best. And if they want to feel however they feel, that's their prerogative. You can't control it. And you've got to stop worrying about and giving a fuck about things you can't control. And on the other side of that coin, if you are somebody who suffers from FOMO and the fear of missing out, and you are, as you said, worried that they'll never invite you again, mm. if, assuming that you want to be invited at some point when it's convenient <laughs> for you. Yeah. Um, I actually talk about this extensively in Fuck No, where you can be honest and you can say, I can't make it tonight, but please don't stop inviting me. <gasps> you know, you can- That's a great idea. Things. You can you can ask for what you need. Um, and that way you don't have to worry about it because you don't have to wonder if they're all talking about why you really said no, because you told them why. You told them I can't make it. And you can't. You know, maybe you can't make it because you can't stand the thought of sitting next to your friend's new boyfriend for three hours. But it's so <laughs> you can't make it. It's and, almost, you know, it's almost, and, it's, and I think a lot of the time when I've said no in the past or other people do, you almost feel powerful, almost. You feel good. You, you sometimes feel better saying no. It's extremely liberating. And Isn't this it? is what readers tell me all the time. Oh my God, I tried it. I feel like a drug dealer actually, because I keep telling people, <laughs> just try it, try it. You're going to love it. Um, but they do, they try it. It works. They, they feel good about it and it gives them the courage to try again. And again, this isn't about going out in the world and saying absolutely zero fucks given. I say no to everything. I hate everyone. Yeah. You know, I'm alone in my house, invitationless, friendless until the end of time. That's not what this is about. It's about choosing your battles, setting your boundaries, allocating your fuck budget to the things that serve you, which is a, is a distinction I like to make because yes, you want to be doing mostly things that make you happy and that benefit you. But like some things don't make you happy, but they serve you in other ways. For example, going to work to get a paycheck mm. so that you can pay your rent. Um, and so you do have to allocate these, these resources, this time and energy uh, to spend on some things that maybe aren't the best thing you're doing all day, but they still serve you and you acknowledge that you need to do them. So for example, in the, in the dinner party mm. uh, situation, you want to be on it in the morning for work. You don't want to be hungover. You want to have slept well and you need to go into work and be alert so that you can get your work done in your eight hours so that you can go home and spend time with your partner or your family, which was your goal in the first place. Beautiful. So all of this stuff is intertwined is what I'm saying. And um, I mean, I, my therapist once uh, gave me a little bit of a golden nugget, for, especially, you know, being Irish. She said, uh, never say yes unless you have the permission to say no, which is mm. a, a lovely little thing, you know, because, you know, if if you say no to somebody and they get pissed off, then they're not really that much of a friend of yours. You know what I mean? They're not great yeah. friend. So I go I go there and in, in fuck now. I talk yeah. about those people. <laughs> yeah. So that's like your tribe, isn't it, Sarah? A lot of people like I, I started doing this thing uh, recently because um, I'm like separated recently. And well, you know, about two years now, whatever. And I started to gather a, a kind of a tribe around me, like good people, you know, that I, co mm -hmm. I could say no to. And it was amazing. You know, it kind of, I got rid of other people that I just weren't making me feel good. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I say in the book, like there's, there's levels of people who will, who will say, you say no. And they say, oh, really? That's <laughs> natural. All you have to do is say, yeah, really. And then they go on about their business. You know, a lot of this preemptive guilt that you're feeling about saying no is all in your own head. Most people will take it in the spirit in which it was delivered. Um, but you have to understand that their automatic reaction might be to say, oh, like, are you sure? Like, I'd love to have you there. And you can say, I am sure. I'd love to be there, but I can't. You know, and it goes away. There will be other people who will push and yeah. they will actively try to make you feel like a bad person for saying no to whatever it is you said no to. Mm. And again, 
if you know that you've acted respectfully and responsibly, you can be, you know, you can feel good about that and they can feel however they want to feel. And if they push you hard enough, you can say, I have to say that you not being able to take no for an answer, I think says more about you than it does about me. Yeah, it's definitely their insecurities that are pushing onto you, isn't it? You know, they're like, oh, why Yeah, because not? people think they can't say no. So they're <laughs> like, well, why is she saying no? I'm not allowed to say no. And it gets, they get very like confused and, and defensive about it. And it's not just that they want you to do something. It's that they don't like the idea that you are someone who thinks you don't have to do these things. But the more you do it, and I've noticed this in my own friend group, um, the more you set your boundaries and stick to them and the happier as a result, people watch this happening in you and they go, oh, I want to be more like that. Yeah, because, good. because people, they always say nobody trusts a yes person. They don't trust that somebody who goes, yes, 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 yes. Because mm -hmm. you don't want someone like that. Like, you know, yeah. like if you're in a business meeting, I've been in a few business meetings where people start to question things and go, no, we're not too sure. That's the guy or the girl you want to be dealing with. The one who's yeah, kind of not saying yes. Say the no you want to hear in the world, man. Yeah. Oh, my God. And uh, Absolutely. And so, look, just the thing now with the COVID things, here, because we're just trying to get mm -hmm. around stuff now. In my head, I was just thinking of people at home with the COVID right now. And um, a lot of people are not doing are not at work. A lot of people can't work right now. And so do you reckon there's people out there? Because I know a couple of mates of mine who are now kind of going along the lines of not giving a fuck in a way of kind of reevaluating their lives. And now that they're not having to commute into center of town anymore, they're seeing their families they're beginning to change their jobs. They don't want to do the job that they did. And, and, yeah, I mean, and, and they're, trying, I think, they're trying to deal with that, you know? I think that is going to be a, a massive and widespread result of uh, this, this quarantining and isolation that we've all been doing. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of people about this. For me, it hasn't changed my life so much because I was already working from home for five years. I had already discovered the benefit of not commuting, <laughs> um, not putting on pants, uh, not having to you know, present myself uh, to, to an office full of people every day. Um, but I do think that this enforced period of naysaying, um, this time in which we have all not been asked to do a lot of things, and even if we are asked, we we have to say no because we cannot do them, yeah. is allowing people to realize how busy uh, and and overcrowded and perhaps under under gratifying their lives had been, and some of it. You know, you want to be able to go out to uh, to the pub with your friends, and you want to be able to travel and uh, and see other other cities and, and visit far flung family and stuff. But some of it, really, we could just permanently do away with. And yeah. if that is, I'm not. I don't want to Pollyanna this because this is a bad in here. But if if something good can come out of it, I think that reevaluating of our lives and how we spend our fuck budgets. Uh, is definitely a positive. Yeah, look, I, I was saying that it felt like, especially for me as a stand-up, and I was I, I can't do my shows anymore right now. And but I was traveling and moving and moving and traveling, and it was getting a lot. And and think so, I, I described it almost like being in a washing machine, like being just thrown around a washing machine. Mm -hmm. And with with COVID, somebody just pressed the washing machine off, took us all out, and just hung us out to dry. <laughs> and now. I even me, I'm going, God, do I really want to go gigging around again now all around the country and around Britain and Ireland and Australia? And I could just do it from here. Like it's it's I'm really well, slowing I mean, down. The, the point is that we all we have an opportunity right now um, to consider these options. And only you, uh, only the people listening know what's going to work for their lives, what's going to work financially, what's going to work psychologically and and health wise and all of that but is is anxiety is that a clinical thing is that like a diagnosed thing is that or is that just something that you cause yourself do you know what i mean uh, it is both um you know i i suffer from clinical anxiety i have been diagnosed with it and i have uh i have medication for it and i have various therapies that i do that that work for me that might not work for other people mm. uh and so i will take this opportunity to say when i talk about anxiety and treatments for it i am not a professional i am only giving personal anecdotes yeah. don't sue me um <laughs> yeah. but but in calm the fuck down uh which is my book all about not only anxiety but also problem solving in stressful situations 
situations. Mm -hmm. I talk about it from the point of view of people who experience situational anxiety. You know, my husband is not an anxious person. He does not have clinical anxiety, but there are going to be situations in his life that cause him to feel really anxious and Mm -hmm. have these same physiological reactions that a person like me has pretty much every day. So I try to make Calm the Fuck Down a really broad, broadly applicable book for people who have anxiety in particular situations and need to learn how to deal with it. And also for people who live with anxiety on a daily basis and need to learn how to deal with it. And it's basically the same, you know, it's, these are the same, uh, techniques and tips and tools for everyone. And obviously some will work for some people and some will work better for others, Mm. but I think it's really important that we destigmatize anxiety and panic and depression by talking about it and saying like, look, you know, so many people are going through this and there are ways out of it if we can talk about it. You know, if you don't talk about it, then you're just alone, you know, huddling in your bed waiting for it to be over, which is not really a useful therapeutic practice. Yeah, because because with anxiety, like, because you talk about goals as well, setting goals, like, you know, whatever could be weight loss or like, you know, getting like, you know, more money or whatever you want to do, makes makes you happier hanging out with the kids. But but as you said later on, making the lists and the goals and everything can get us quite anxious and just make it worse. You know what I mean? So I think that it, it's probably more advisable to work out what goals you want to do slower, you know, mm-hmm. and work out which is the main one. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all small manageable chunks and, you know, across all of my books, I really, I, I really keep talking about prioritizing. It's so important to prioritize and narrow your focus. Multitasking is a myth. Um, You really can't do everything at once. And you certainly can't do a bunch of things well, if you're trying to do them all simultaneously. So it's important, kind of like what I talked about where I made the decision to leave my job, my career. I mean, it was a, a whole career that I decided okay, we're done with this. Um, That was a process of prioritizing and kind of eliminating and focusing in and being like, when I feel awful, when I'm panicking, when I'm feeling anxious, Mm. what is the root cause? It's not, you know, the literal work. It's not even putting in the the 10 hours a day or editing all day on the weekends. I liked that. Um, What is it? And I kept having to ask these questions and narrow the focus. And really what it was was a sense that I was doing all of this labor on behalf of other people and not on my own behalf. And that it turns out I'm the kind of person who really wants to be my own boss and do my own thing and reap the success if it's warranted and admit, you know, cop to the failure if it isn't. But I I just hated being stuck in that office diplomacy kind of situation. Yeah, it was like you were like, so the, you were like, a, I focused, you, you were, you, know? you were somebody else's battery. You were like, you were like the battery running the, running the radio instead of you being the radio. It's yeah. Like, yeah. And, you know, and once I narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and figured out the problem, I was able to address it. And I think a lot of times people get so overwhelmed because they feel like they have so many problems, but it's like, I talk about in get your shit together, the must do list. Yeah. So it's taking your to-do list, which is way too long, <laughs> and narrowing it down by urgency, reordering it. What has to be done today? What okay. is due first? What deadline is most urgent? And once you do that, you you get everything else off the list and you, you do the stuff you must do today. And you could go from a 20 item list to a three item list if you do that. And so it's a good way to, to focus on your entire life. What is most urgent? What problem do I have to solve first? I love a list. I mean, I I I, I, I love a list. I mean, I I love crossing things off. I literally get a kick out of it. I go, oh yeah, that's done. Oh yeah, that's done. But I have to have a list, you know, because my my brain does go off into all sorts of stuff as well. Because my other the other anxiety that I can I get is the is the what ifs and uh, what mm-hmm. my what my therapist said, which is uh, forecasting. Like I mm-hmm. constantly go. I mean, I have I have till the end of the year rewritten in my head. And like my therapist is going, no, 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 you can't control all this stuff. Like, so I think that a lot of us think that we can control situations and people. And so we just can't, you know, so the calming down and this, and just, re, and just trying to sort ourselves out day by day with our lists is a good way. Yeah. And, and, you know, to sort of flip that on itself, focus on the things you can control. You know, I tell people they have to just let go of what they can't control. And they say, that's too hard. I can't, how, how are you saying that? That's so facile. But, but the flip side of it is, okay, what can you control out of this? Focus on that. Spend your time, energy, and money on that. You know, 
if if there's a big situation that is out of your control, but a little part of it is within your control, then focus on that. And you can feel centered and you can feel like you're you're making progress and and all of that, but you don't you can you can ignore or put on the back burner uh the bigger, further, further afield things until they become urgent and at the top of your must-do list. And then you can focus on those. Yeah, and it's 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 amazing because a lot of lot when you listen to people like yourself and you listen to loads of and I know you're an anti-guru, which I love. I love that uh, that expression. And it, it but when you listen to people and, you, and even you saying that, you go, we already know. Isn't it mad that we already know? We like we go, yeah, I, I already know that. I should really shit. Why didn't I just do that? I already fucking know. Like it's like so. I was talking to a neuroscientist last week, and he told me to sim- the sim. I'm intimidated. Yeah, no, 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 no. Hey. Come on, me, I barely got through school. Anyway, so <laughs> I said, he said to me, it's very simple. He goes, when you're stressed and you're feeling down, uh, basically that builds up in your brain, you know, the cortisol, he called it, which was, uh, mm-hmm. which was it builds up and it builds up the more, the more you're, you're down. He said, very simple way of making yourself happy again is your diet, uh, yoga, meditation, or exercise. And I went, is there anything else? He goes, no, no, that's pretty. It. <laughs> I'm going what? Yeah. All yeah. these books and all the fucking what do you see? He goes, well, it's not that easy, Jason. You know, but yeah. but he's but it's it's it was amazing to hear how the chemical thing works in your head. It's actually going on in there. You know that you can make yourself happy and sad. Yeah, I mean, many years ago when I first started having panic attacks, or at least when I knew I was having panic yeah, attacks, I think I've been having them since I was a kid, but I didn't really know. Yeah, um, I went to a doctor who explained all of that. Uh, to me and the, and the cortisol, uh, you know, creating that fight or flight reaction within yeah. you. And then you become paralyzed and, uh, and, it, and it's really bad. And she said, you know, you have to deregulate, you have to use these techniques, meditation, rest, you know, uh, changes in diet, meaning, you know, perhaps less alcohol, more of other things that, that make you feel more relaxed. Um, and I was like, ah, like that's it. Like what? Like what? Why is this happening? You know. And um, I actually just started meditating about a month ago myself. It was it was one of the, the therapeutic uh, ideas that I had been like, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. No, it's, it feels weird. I don't. Nope, not into it. And this pandemic really has been testing my own tried and true ways of of calming the fuck down. So I was like, well, I guess I'll try a new thing. And it's going pretty well. I like it. But do you believe in this this statement here? I'm going to read this here. It says, nobody else is responsible for your situation but you. Like, so are you responsible for your life? You know, again, people can't be fully responsible for their lives, but most of their lives. Is that your fault, the way you are? So my my feeling is that even if somebody else uh, perpetuates a situation like you get fired yeah. and, and it wasn't your fault. You you say you've been downsized. Yeah. Um, obviously your employer did that to you. That was not something that was not your fault. But what I believe is that you're the architect of, of how you handle it. You know, you are the only person who can decide how you handle it. Are you going to, you know, completely lose your shit and go off the rails or are you going to have a good cry and a, and, and a woe is me for a while. And then pick yourself up and figure out the way forward. Nobody is put on earth to do that for you. So even though you are sometimes uh, at the at the mercy of the the greater world, um, a person who who breaks up with you or a person who, you know, lets you go from your job, um, you you are the only one who is uh, who is here and able to find your way out of it. And you can ask for help. You can read books. You can listen to podcasts. Mm-hmm. You can meditate. Uh, you can go to a therapist. But but you are making those decisions to do those things. And um, I I find you've got to be honest with yourself as well, because because as well over here in Ireland, as I said, we are like yes people, and we will tell people what they want to hear. So no matter what you look like, we will go. You look fabulous. Right. And even if you are going along and you can't breathe properly and your diet's all over the place and you have a bottle of wine in your hand, people are going, you look fabulous. I love your diet. And sure, everybody has a drink. But are you talking about me? No, 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 Sarah. (laughs) (laughs) I thought, yeah, I got Um, pictures of you in Dominican Republic (laughs) crossing the road. This is water that I'm drinking. Oh, yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My auntie used to do that. She used to drink uh, cups of tea, but there was no tea in it. It's like... (laughs) Um, you know, one thing I really appreciate about my husband and, and he and I have been together for 20 years. So it's, it's been a long road. He says, I will never lie to you. 
Uh, I will tell you if those pants don't look right. And, you know, I will tell you if that haircut, I will tell you if that haircut was wrong, but then you will always be able to trust that when I say you look great, you sound great, you did great, that I'm telling you the truth. And, you know, this is something that we all have to internalize and do for ourselves. We have to tell ourselves the truth. Jesus Christ. I'm having a panic attack here just listening to you. Oh, I no, mean, I mean, no, that's that's like I, take I mean, a breath. The amount, of, in. the amount of men, <laughs> the amount of men in the world that lie to their wives, like straight out. No, you look great. No, that dress is whatever. But like, I've got a new partner now, which has been great. Mm-hmm. And I have learned a lot. And again, being honest, even though it might hurt them for a few seconds, they're so happy later on. Like they'd go, well, look, I'm so glad you said that dress was like horrific, horrific on me. <laughs> like, like, like now I look actually really good, uh, you know, and it, it did. Like, that's that's the, the same power of saying no. Is, I mean, it's I, about building trust. Yeah. And so, you know, you have to be able to recognize these things in yourself. And if you can express them to other people, I mean, maybe going back to the example of the dinner party, maybe you say to your friend, you know, I, I really love hanging out with you, but you always have these late night, weeknight parties. Could you possibly think about having a dinner party on a Friday night? And then I would be there with bells on. And maybe they'll be like, oh, you know, I've been doing it on Wednesdays because on Fridays I have this class and I could (laughs) totally switch my class. And that's a really good idea. You know, it's possible that if you just kind of are honest and polite without, you know, Mm. attacking someone and without, you know, make, you know, sort of. Uh, haranguing them for their decision making, you might affect some change uh, in a positive way. So yeah, and I think a good relationship is an honest relationship. Exactly what you said about your husband. If everybody can just listen to that, is just just tell the truth all the time. Just tell how you feel all the time. Just help each other that way, and it just flourishes. It just mm-hmm. flourishes. It's beautiful. But look, um, Sarah. Listen, that has been, oh my God, I said half an hour. I'm so sorry. It's been longer. I knew you were lying. So. I know, I know, but I'm there. You know, you know, I'm Irish. <laughs> but listen, I was, um, one one last thing, uh, which I I heard, which is an amazing thing. Uh, everybody roughly lives for about 4,000 weeks, which is an amazing little thing. And it's, uh, so this lovely coach friend of mine said, uh, so for those 4,000 weeks, you have to spend all of that time with yourself. So you may as well, you may as well make it a good 4,000 weeks. Which was I a, love that. That's great. <laughs> which is a lovely, lovely thing. But look, Sarah, thanks for, thanks for, thanks for talking to us. Um, all your books, I mean, you've got, you've got uh, No Fucks Given Guide, the advice from the swim pool I was watching as well, which was great fun. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's, that's brilliant. And you're an amazing woman. You're a fantastic human. I, you're so brave for doing what you did and continuing on to write. And and you and you you you, you keep saying, I see you writing everywhere. Going in your books, you go, I'm not qualified. I'm just going to tell you this. And uh, you're so qualified. You're like living it, and you're helping us all the time. Like to help us in any way is like qualified. Well, thank you. And I'm just out here doing my thing. And um, and if it helps people, then, you know, that helps me keep doing it because I hear from people and they say, this really did change my life. I thought I thought I didn't like self-help. I thought I didn't need help. I thought I was just reading it for the F-bombs. Mm. Uh, and as it turns out, you know, maybe I have some some fruitful things to say. And again, I just want to destigmatize uh, mental health and mental health issues because if if nobody talks about it, then everybody feels alone and that is not the way forward oh. so thank you for giving me the opportunity well thanks sarah and again i mean you're such a massive individual thanks for coming on our little podcast in ireland it's just been fantastic and you've helped so many people all right that was sarah knight there uh, on mind your loaf wow she is like she's a big deal i'm just so glad to have spoken to her. I mean, she is an expert in like not giving a shit about things. But again, as she says, you know, we, we do actually give a shit about some stuff and that, that can, you know, we can serve our time on that. And then there's part, t- bits and little tiny, like don't sweat the small stuff, basically. There's no need to bother about that stuff. So don't worry about that. So her books are so good. You've, you've got to get her books, listen to her no fucks uh, guide on on the internet as well. And I know she's, she does say fuck quite a lot. So look here, we're Irish. It, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, but she's had to go, go through the whole anxiety, like how we can do our lists. And the biggest thing for all Irish people is how to say no. How can we say no? It's just impossible, but this is it. 
We're at home right now and we can practice. So try it, try it today. If your friend goes, oh my God, I'll see you at Friday at four o'clock in the park. Just go, eh, no, and see what happens. Could be a good result. All right, well, thanks for listening to Mind Your Loaf, everybody. Mind Your Loafs out there. Keep the anxiety down and get your lists. Get your lists made, people. Get your lists made. See you later. Bye. You have been listening to Jason Byrne and this has been Mind Your Loaf. If you like this episode, please subscribe and tell your friends. And don't forget, if you or somebody you know is going through a tough time, there is professional mental health support online from counselling to support groups, all available for free to anyone from Ireland at turntome.ie. Mind your loaves, everyone. Turn to me provides professional mental health support. Ah, online. Jason, oh. do your, uh, you know, your ad voice. Oh yeah, I'll do the yeah, ad. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'll do a proper ad okay. thing. Okay, ready? Yeah. As a registered charity, Turn to Me provides professional mental health support online for anyone in Ireland going through a tough time. From one-to-one counselling to group and peer support, Turn to Me is accessible from any device anywhere in Ireland. If you would like to support Turn to Me, you can donate four euros by texting Turn to Me to 50300. Text costs four euros. Turn to Me will receive a minimum of three euro sixty service provider like charity. Helpline 07 Six six eight zero five two seven eight. Is that you? Yeah, that was actually me. Okay. There.